We ready? Good evening. Welcome to the June 28, 2020 evening service of Westwood Heights Baptist Church. Uh, glad to have you uh, join us. Uh, we'll be turning to John chapter 7 in just a moment. I mentioned at the end of the live stream that we, were, we are planning to resume public services next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And so uh, we invite you back for that. Obviously, if your uh, health is at all questionable, that probably you would um, <clears throat> not want to be here. So I'm, I'm guessing there'll be uh, some folks not here, but we plan to resume next Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, we made the decision to not have Vacation Bible School uh, this year, just thought in light of everything that was going on in the time frame that it would be the best decision. I've uh, talked to Brother Smith about that already, and so we're uh, working together with him uh, for 2021. And of course, as always, I appreciate your prayers and concern uh, for what is going on with my, my vision. I had eye surgery uh, last Tuesday. The doctor is pleased with where things are. I go back to him the 30th uh, for yet another follow-up. And so we're, <clears throat> we're just uh, praying for, for complete recovery and full healing and uh, <clears throat> marvel at all that the Lord has allowed us to do uh, medically uh, in, in recent days. Uh, John chapter 7 uh, this evening. Two weeks ago, uh, we began turning our attention to the subject matter of judgment. And I wanted to give some time to judgment, not God's judging of us, which is real enough and the impetus for us to be very careful about the kind of judgments we make, but specifically about the, the fact that um, as believers, as human beings, uh, we, are, we make all kinds of judgments about all kinds of things. Um, and I said last two weeks ago, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was that churches like ours tend to be viewed as rather judgmental, which to me is ironic because that in itself um, is a judgment, and it just highlights the difficulty of the subject. We make all kinds of judgments. So in my mind, just to kind of help you think through what I'm endeavoring to do here, I wanted to take two weeks, last Sunday night, or two weeks ago Sunday night and tonight, and just kind of introduce us, kind of establish the, the boundaries, so to speak. Uh, we began with looking at Matthew 7, judge not lest ye be not judged, and all that went into that passage, um, in which I argued it is not an absolute prohibition. And then I want to conclude kind of the introduction with the passage from John chapter 7. And I, I think when we get to verse number 24, you'll understand where I'm trying to go with this, although admittedly, we're going to make a big loop this evening to get back to that passage. John chapter 7, verse number 1, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore sent unto him, Depart thence, go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is alway ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. 
He that speaketh of himself seeketh of his own seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye anger at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath? Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, I pray for the help of your Holy Spirit. These are your words. And the meaning is the meaning that you have for them. It is not my place to give them their meaning. The meaning is yours. We seek, Lord, to find your meaning in the text. And I pray then the help of your spirit to that end. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last time I preached... The subject matter was, judge not lest ye be judged. And the implications of that, what we extracted from that passage, Matthew 7, 1 through 6. We discovered that it is not an absolute prohibition, but that it does require certain things of us in the way of judgment. In this passage, using the same word, judge, Jesus obligates us to make righteous judgments. Now, the entire context, and we're going to walk our way through a lot of geography and chronology to get here, but the judgment that is at the forefront that Jesus is talking about in this passage is rightly recognizing him as the Messiah, as recognizing him as the one that God has sent, as the one he claims to be. And that is a righteous judgment that is required of all of us to recognize Jesus for who he is. We will, from that, extract a couple of principles about judgments in general, because Jesus deals with a specific situation that required them to make difficult decisions and pointed that out to them. Um, So let's try to get our minds around how we get to this point in the conversation. Of course, we know that John's gospel is different anyway. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptic. They're seen from the same eye. John is different in that Jesus is presented most heavily, most exclusively, not as simply a man, but as God in a human body, the the word that became flesh. There are a lot of differences in John's gospel compared to the other gospel. And one of the issues that is really dealt with in John's gospel is kind of these secret movements on the part of Jesus. They have fascinated and perplexed people for many years. But let's just go back and see how the the ebb and flow of the ministry has gone. Turn. Let me ask you if you would to turn back to John chapter 4 for just a moment. At this point in time, in the gospel history, the nation of Israel, of course, is occupied by Gentiles. It is under Roman rule, and it is divided then politically primarily in two ways. There's the northern province known as Galilee. There's the southern province known as Judea, and it is in Judea that Jerusalem is located. And there are then, of course, two Roman officials, Pontius Pilate and Herod, who are the governors of this, and that's where they come into play at the very end of the gospel story when Jesus is being put on trial. So Jesus moves back and forth between these these, uh, two regions freely. There's not a big border or anything that you have to cross. But it's helpful for us to notice that the story 
goes in, in both ways. So John chapter four, verse number one, when the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, we're not gonna develop this, but this is an interesting perspective on numerical success, isn't it? One of the great failures of fundamentalism to make so much out of numbers, which really means so little. Um, <clears throat> Jesus didn't hold a conference trying to tell John how to get his baptisms up. Um, <clears throat> he just went somewhere else. He left the area completely. And in order to go from Judea to Galilee, he needed to go through the region that is Samaria, that hated place that uh, dedicated Judean Jews did not want to enter. And this, of course, is where he meets uh, the woman at the well. Jump down, if you would, to verse number 45 of John chapter 4. So Jesus has left Judea, heading to Galilee through Samaria, John 4, 45, then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him. The Galileans are the northerners of the, the nation. Then John chapter 5 and verse number 1, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And so Jesus had gone north to Galilee, then he had traveled geographically south to come into Judea, but since Jerusalem is on a mountain, it's always up. So <clears throat> he went south <clears throat> and then up the mountain to go to Jerusalem back in Ju to Judea. Now, what happens in John chapter 5, we will come back to. Just jump over to John chapter 6 and verse number 1. And again, I'm just trying to chase through the geography here. Jesus has been in Judea, and he goes to Galilee by way of Samaria, and then he leaves Galilee, and he goes back into Judea. John chapter 6, verse number 1, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And so he has departed now again Jerusalem, and he has gone back into the north into Galilee. And in John 6, this is where he feeds 5,000. This is where the people endeavor to make him a king. And so Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee to get away, and this is where the Sermon of the Bread of Life is preached. He is in a particular city there, John 6, 59. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And so he is really up on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee at that point in time. <clears throat> and that brings us then to John chapter 7, where we began. Verse number 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry. Jewry is Judea. In fact, the, the word is used 44 times in the New Testament. 43 of them, it is translated Judea, but for some reason, it is translated here with the word Jewry, but it is Judea. Jesus would not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. But then, and so the implication is that he wouldn't go publicly, but he did go secretly. Verse number nine, of John chapter 7, when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, and these are his physical brothers, his unbelieving physical siblings, when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Judea, Galilee, Judea, Galilee, back to Judea. Judea in secret. And what are going on are two things. <clears throat> One is the determined effort to kill him, and he's not operating out of fear. We cannot believe that. He's operating out of a sense of timing, not fearfulness. And the subject matter of all the conversations is the identity of Jesus. Who are you? And we can see that. Let me just take your Bible and look, please at some verses in chapter seven, and you can see that the clear subject matter is here is the identity of Jesus Christ. John seven twelve. there was much murmuring concern among the people concerning him. For some said he is a good man, others said nay, but he deceives the people. Verse number 25, then said some of them uh, uh, of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? 
But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Verse number 31. Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Verse number 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is a prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. Some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh to the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Verse number 52, they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. So the ongoing conversation is, who is this man? He's done all the right miracles, but he's not out of the right place. Who is this man? And Jesus then, in the intervening verses, is arguing that the evidence is clear that he is, in fact, the Messiah. In verses 1 through 6, he argues to them that he operates on his own time. And again, this colors our understanding of why Jesus went in secret, not out of fear, not out of timidity, but out of timing. He could not be killed at that moment. It was the wrong time for him to die. In verses 3 through 5, Jesus makes the argument that he will not bow to the pressure of men to perform. He's, he's not a circus puppet or a circus monkey. He doesn't come out on stage at the appointed time and fulfill the demands of men. He is God with his own will and his own agenda, that which is set by the Father. He is faithful to that which the Father decrees. And that's what he's arguing in verses 15 through 17. I am faithful to God's word. I am faithful to God's word. Look at verse number 16. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will. And folks, may I just pause here and say to you, we use that verse a lot evangelistically, and it's a great verse to say to people. But it's not just a verse for unbelievers, it's a verse for believers. We have to be willing to know God's will. We have to be willing to do God's will in order to come to an understanding of what the doctrine is. We have to have an appetite to know the truth, to know the truth. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. So in those first 18 verses, Jesus is explaining, defending his identity. I operate on God's time frame, not yours. I am not a trained animal who performs upon command of men. But instead, I am faithful to the word of God, and I am not in the pursuit of my own glory. I am in pursuit of the glory of the one that sent me. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And that brings us then to the passage that I want to use this evening to help us understand the principles that Jesus is articulating about judgment. Don't judge on appearances. Judge righteous judgments. In verse number 19, Jesus points out to them that Moses gave them the law, and yet they were lawbreakers and wanted to kill Jesus for being a lawbreaker. Did not Moses give you the law? Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keepeth the law. Moses gave it to you. You don't keep it. And yet you want to kill me. Verse number 19. Why go ye about to kill me? 
The people take great exception to this and deny that this is true. The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? You're you're demon-possessed. You're crazy. Well, they don't call him crazy. They call him demon-possessed. The demons inhabit you. Nobody's trying to kill you. Verse number 21, Jesus' response to that, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. I did one work, and ye all marvel. And it's there, folks, that I want to pause, because let us remember that John is the man who told us that he didn't think it would be possible for the world to hold the books if we tried to write down everything that Jesus did and said. But Jesus is very emphatic here. I did one work. And he even tells us what that work is. We will look at what the work is in a moment. But let's look at verse number 22. I've done one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Now all of this goes back, folks, to John chapter 5. There is no work that Jesus did in John chapter 7. Neither is the work that he is doing described in John chapter 6. The work is found in John chapter 5. And let's just take a minute and turn back to it. And look, it is not the work of feeding the 5,000. It is this work, John 5, 1, after this there was a feast of the Jews, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind halt withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in what was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And then you have this very telling signal. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And on the same day was the Sabbath. This then brings the condemnation of the Jews. The Jews therefore sent unto him that was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place. And afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. In verses 17 and 18, Jesus responds to that criticism and persecution in this way. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. 
Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. So to go back to John chapter 7, this is the one work. This is the one work. Jesus is about to be killed by the Jews because he healed this man on the Sabbath day. I think, folks, we could easily understand that it would have been no big deal for Jesus to have arrived a day early or a day later, and there would have been no issue. But Jesus deliberately chose the Sabbath day to heal this man. And he deliberately put this man into the position of being a Sabbath breaker. You are not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath. To go back to John chapter 7, this I think is why Jesus is talking to them about circumcision on the Sabbath day. Verse 21, I've done one work ye all marvel. Moses gave unto you circumcision. In other words, folks, we have to ask the question as we read the text, we, we have to ask the text, what does circumcision have to do with healing a man at the pool of Bethesda? What does one have to do with the other? How does circumcision play into healing on the Sabbath? Well, let's just talk briefly about circumcision itself. Circumcision is the physical removal of the male foreskin. It is done ritualistically in the Old Testament. And the first place that it happens, which is, you know, Jesus alludes to this, that Moses spoke about circumcision, verse 22, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. The very first circumcision is Genesis chapter 17, long before the law and Moses. The ritualistic removal of the male foreskin is a symbol not only of the covenant, but of what the covenant represents. Let me just give you three verses. You can look at them later on your own. Deuteronomy 10, 16, Deuteronomy 30 and verse number 6, Jeremiah 4 and num verse number 4. In those three verses, God tells them to circumcise their heart or to circumcise the foreskin of their heart. In other words, folks, the circumcision of the male, the physical circumcision of the male, is emblematic of the need to have that which is unclean removed. It is symbolic. It is ritualistic. It didn't accomplish anything. It represented a work that needed to be done internally in the heart. And under the law in which it was regulated in Leviticus 12, it is to be done to the males on the eighth day of their life. So let's go back to John chapter 7, verse number 22. Moses therefore gave unto you the circumcision, not because it is of, the, of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Do you see the conundrum? Folks, we have to see the conundrum. What am I allowed to do on the Sabbath day? Nothing. I'm not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath day. Virtually nothing. And yet if a baby is eight days old on the Sabbath, he needs to be circumcised on the Sabbath. So what do we do? 
Do we disobey the command for the eighth day and, and circumcise him on the seventh or the ninth? Or do we disobey the command on the Sabbath by circumcising him on the eighth day, even if it's the Sabbath? You know, I come out of a background where I probably heard this statement once a month, if not more often, duties never conflict. But they obviously do. And this particular duty conflicted by design by divine design. The Jews opted, and apparently rightfully so, to circumcise on the eighth day regardless of the fact that it probably violated the Sabbath. In other words, when we come back to John chapter 7, folks, Jesus just asked this question, verse number 23, if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. In other words, you weighed through this, you sorted through what the options were, and you came to the conclusion that while it might be violating the Sabbath to, to do the circumcision, it most clearly violated the law of Moses to not do it on the eighth day. So we're going to uphold the law by circumcising on the eighth day. Why are you criticizing me for healing on the Sabbath? How is what I'm doing any different than what you're doing? How am I a lawbreaker for making whole on the Sabbath and you're not a lawbreaker for circumcising on the Sabbath? The Sabbath was sacred and holy and inviolable. Thou shalt not, thou shalt do, not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. Exodus 31, 14, you should keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So the priest would be working and a journey would be occurring and the Sabbath would be broken. So again, the question is, if it is okay to violate the Sabbath by circumcising, why is it not okay to violate the Sabbath by healing? And I think, folks, that it becomes pretty clear to us as we think through what is really going on with the Jews, where the failure in their judgment was. Let me suggest to you, <clears throat> on the basis of this conversation, that righteous judgment, verse number 24, judge not according to appearance, according to that which is seen, but judge righteous judgment, that as believers, we have to be concerned with more than getting the practice right. We want to get the practice right. But folks, to get the practice right without having the purpose right is a wrong thing. It is not something that God ever condones. Which means, if I can put it in New Testament language, which means that we really need, it's not lip service to us. It is the deep cry of our hearts that all that we do be done to the glory of God. That we are not simply appealing to the eye, that we are not doing these things simply because they are seen and perceived by others that we respect and we want to honor them and have their approval. But that the judgments that we make, and we will make many, many judgments about many, many things in the course of our Christian lives, 
that ultimately those judgments are to be made not with a view to the eye of men, but with a view to the eye of God. In other words, I think that we could safely say that if these men had embraced Jesus for who he was, if they had made the right judgment about Jesus, they would not have been tripped up about this particular issue. They would not have been as offended that Jesus did a good deed on the Sabbath day. Failing to make the right judgment about Jesus they could not help but make wrong judgments even about religious endeavors. So again, my intention to you this morning, or this evening, is to, to deal with this passage in kind of sequence with Matthew 7. We cannot back away from all judgments. We cannot. The text will not allow us to say, judge not that ye be not judged, therefore we judge no things. But we are obligated to make all judgments righteous judgments. And those judgments then must be made in the light of God himself. We must endeavor to make all those kinds of judgments on the basis of what is right and pleasing to him above all things. Not, as we might say today, on the optics of the thing. Which means that we have an obligation then to be sincere with ourselves. God desires truth in the inward part. God desires truth in the inward part that we are endeavoring the difficult task of having the Spirit help us to understand that we are doing all things for His glory. That we are endeavoring to make Him supreme in every decision that we make. We will look further to other passages in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, to help us have the mind of Christ on those kinds of decisions in the future. Let's pray this evening and again thank you so much for your attentiveness. We will pray and be dismissed. Our Father, I pray that you would help us that in the many, many judgments that we must make as human beings in this world that we will make the best judgments. Judgments that you can approve because they are right in practice and purpose and I pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen.